Hi, this is Dr. Tony Mark, endoscopic spine specialist. Uh, this past weekend, January 2013, I had the privilege of attending the IITTSS meeting hosted by Dr. Tony Young. During the meeting, I was able to ask about two specific cases, and uh, I hope that you enjoy it. This is part one, and then there's a part two interview on a different subject matter. So, hope you enjoy it. Today, we have Dr. Young here, who is the uh, uh, course director and also the pioneer with the uh, yes endoscopic uh, spinal surgery technique I happen to have brought him a case here today which is of a 30 year old guy who's got a very large disc at L4-5 uh, and the couple things about this uh, the disc herniation as large as it is is actually uh, bulging to the side that his symptoms are not on he has worse symptoms to the side where the disc is not and Maybe you could just comment a little bit about that. Does that happen very often in your experience, Dr. Young? It doesn't happen very often, but when it does happen, you have to believe the patient that the pain is on the side where he hurts in spite of the MRI. Because the MRI optimally can only give you maybe 70% of the absolutely accurate information. The other 30%, you have to correlate that with the patient's complaints, with some other tests that you can do, and, and then with the surgical procedure. The way I handle it is I acknowledge that the pain is on the opposite side of the uh, protrusion. It is a large paracentral and central herniation, but I have to now explain why his pain is on the right side instead of the left side. And as I look at the MRI, I see that in spite of the fact that the herniation is on the left, the left side is pushing the nerve up and it's not causing any impingement. So then you have to identify why it hurts on the right. When I look at this MRI, I see right side has something that could be causing the right leg pain and that's this little area where it looks like a synovial cyst. Okay, that's, that's a great find. In addition to a huge disc which takes up all your attention, you're noticing a synovial cyst as well. Yes. Okay. And that I synovial cyst may be underestimated because most cysts that arise from the facet joint is pedunculated. There's a stalk. And so the big part of it may be exactly in a position that's irritating the nerve that does not show up on the MRI because the MRI takes a cut only specifically at one spot and the smallest cut you can get is a two or three millimeter cut. Are you, are you going to be able to take care of the uh, uh, synovial cyst endoscopically if need be? Absolutely. If the cyst is in an area that is irritating the nerve causing leg pain, I have the ability to see the exiting nerve and the traversing nerve in the axilla in every case if I know how to remove facet and remove soft tissue to get to it. So in that case, I would always look at the axilla between the exiting and traversing nerve, and most of the time, I will see a cystic lesion that does not show up on MRI. The cyst that I see incidentally on endoscopy shows up at least two-thirds of the time when it's not picked up by the MRI. Okay, so let's recap. This is a fellow with a young guy, large disc, and uh, He's got symptoms that are on the opposite side of the disc. So number one, you're going to operate after maybe some other preliminary test. You're going to operate on the side of the pain. Correct. Okay. And number two, if you have at the time of the endoscopic discectomy, you could also address the synovial cyst if that turns out to be an. If you'll be looking for it anyway. Correct. Okay. And then uh, since this fell up, you're going to be operating on the opposite side. Uh, where the disc herniation appears to be in its entirety, you will be able to easily access that side as well. I can go to the opposite side once I'm inside the disc. Okay. Because I have instruments that allows me to come underneath the annulus and reach the protrusion on the opposite side just by debulking and decompressing the disc from, from the opposite side because I can go across to the contralateral side inside the disc. Now you've got a lot more experience than probably the average person uh, uh, watching this video or a a actually more experience than anybody probably else in the world doing this type of technique. So 
for someone with less experience, would they have to use a biportal technique to get to the other side? Or do you have any recommendations for those that may not have as much experience? I recommend after some experience, put a needle so that you can use the other side if you don't uh, feel comfortable that you've taken care of the whole problem. You can always pull the needle out and not have to go by portal. But I would prepare for by portal in case I don't see everything that confirms that I've decompressed the herniation as well as the, the foramen which has the pain generator. The first thing I would do is I would do a foraminal epidurogram and look at the pattern of the epidurogram so that I can either identify the cyst or identify uh, a deviation of the nerve root sheath. Then I would put in a therapeutic injection of corticosteroid plus marcaine and that should take away the patient's pain. So if I do epidurogram and I see a space occupying lesion then I do a epidural therapeutic injection, takes away the pain on the right. Then I know the source of the pain is in the foramen on the right. And at that area, I can decompress the disc, go all the way across to the left side, enough so that I take the protrusion out. I can then uh, remove some of the facet joint and work my way to the tip of the facet in the axilla where you have thickened ligamentum flavum, scar tissue, cysts, uh, or anything that could irritate the nerve in the foramen. After I decompress that, I will look at the exiting nerve and I'll decompress enough that I can see the traversing nerve on the, on the right side. And if I have that done and I can look across the disc to the opposite side, then I don't need to go by portal. If I think that there's a fragment there that I can't get, then I'll come in on the left side and uh, look at the disc where you have the, where the herniation shows up on the MRI. Using a biportal technique. Using biportal. Yeah. So basically, you, we, we have to identify the cause of the pain, have a pretty good idea with the roadmap given to you by discography, by epidurography, by therapeutic injection, then have the surgical procedure uh, with a trajectory in a manner that you can reach herniation on both sides, clear up the foramen, the anatomy, the, the uh, axilla on the left side, and the side if you want to put a, another window on the opposite side. So that comes with lots of experience like yours. I would say if you've done a thousand, you already have enough experience to do all this. If we're just starting, pick some uh, easier case and uh, it'll be, uh, you'll get good results. In this one, this is a very advanced case and there'll be perhaps different, uh, there will be different opinions by different people who have different experiences. But for an endoscopic spine surgeon who is used to seeing the normal and pathoanatomy, this is something that's pretty routine. I chose this case because it's, it, although it looks just huge, it looks like it should be a very easy disc to approach, there are a lot of subtleties about this case that might elude the beginner looking at it. So maybe not the ideal case to begin with. That's correct. But if you don't make the patient worse, the patient will be better to various degrees. Might be 50% better, 75% better, 95. What I described should give you a 95% chance of getting pain resolved. I hope you enjoyed uh, part one of uh, giving the, some of the nuances of treating this large central disc herniation. Stay tuned for part two when we talk about some of the nuances of a rhizotomy for treating low back pain.